Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast, presented by Canon Press. This is The Plodcast. I'm Douglas Wilson. Welcome to The Plodcast. This is episode 213. Episode 213, here we are. I want to talk a little bit today about the sin of being white. The sin of being white. Now, this has sort of been a remarkable turnabout in, in race relations. A lot, of, a lot of Christians feel like over the last two years, the ground has given way underneath our feet. It's like a lot of things that we thought were stable or, or assured or, okay, we all agree on that now, have been suddenly reversed on us. And so you, you say, what do we need to do? Well, well, here's an example. What people are saying is that white is a state of mind. And if you are ethnically white, uh, you are a beneficiary of that state of mind. And you're going to have that state of mind running in the background uh, for the rest of your life, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you are sinful for partaking in that white frame of mind, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can become anti-racist. You can sort of ameliorate it by becoming anti-racist. The best thing I can, I can compare it to is the the dogma that is um, that surrounds alcoholism? So it's like white people are treated as alcoholics, as drunks, and uh, a drunk can be dry. And if he is following this program, he says, "I haven't had a drink for twenty years, but I'm still an alcoholic, and I still have to face it every day. And I, you know, I I'm going to embrace this uh, alcoholism." as an essential part of my identity. That's what's being demanded of white people in, in an analogous way. So you, are, you happen to be physiologically white, and you might say, well, I can't do anything about that. No, but you, they'll, they'll retort, no, but you can self-consciously repudiate all the privileges that come to you as a result of being white, and you can recognize that there are countless privileges that you just take as your birthright, and it's actually because you're white, and you need to become a lot more hostile to that construct. All right. Now, this is all Antichrist. Christians ought to react to this kind of critical race theory or woke, being woke as applied to race relations as, as an Antichrist gospel, because that's precisely what it is. It's a gospel that is no gospel. There's sin in it. There's crime and there's sin. There's original sin. You, you're guilty of the original sin of being white. And there's no forgiveness, no grace, no Christ, no cross, no reconciliation. The best you can hope to do is to be sort of a distrusted ally in the anti-racist cause. So you, you're a white guy and you drink the Kool-Aid and you, you're the kind of person who thinks, who actually believes that if you apologize to all your coworkers for being white, if you send out that sort of craven apology, you actually believe that that will somehow make something better somehow. It won't, but you, you've been uh, brought to that state of mind. If you crawl on all fours and you apologize for being white, What's going to happen is the people who are using you, and that's what they're doing, the people who are using you are never going to accept you. They're never going to embrace you. They're never going to have fellowship with you. They're never going to welcome you. There will never be reconciliation. They will use you for the time being. They'll use you as long as you're useful. This is a message straight from the pit. It has nothing to do with a godly and biblical approach to ethnic tension a godly and biblical approach to ethnic hostilities, which is to recognize that all of us, men, women, blacks, whites, Asians, everybody, is a horrible sinner, and we've all offended God. And if we are made new in Christ, 
one of the things he does is he makes one new man out of the two. If God can make one new man out of Jew and Gentile, then those, those guys didn't get along at all. If he can do that, he can certainly do that with uh, the ethnic tensions and the ethnic groups that we have today. So we're continuing with episode 213 in, in the podcast, and, and you guessed it, this is our hamartiology section. One of the great challenges to the church in the early years was the challenge of idolatry. The Lordship of Christ was proclaimed by Christians in a challenge to the older gods. Paul taught that they were not actually gods, but were rather demons, which made the alternative a stark one. So it's either the living God, you either worship the living God, or you worship demons. And the word for idolatry, and that's what we're talking about today, is the, the abstract concept idolatry, idola latreia, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A, idola latreia. So, the word is used, this word is used four times in the New Testament. In one place, Christians are simply told to run away, stay away, get away from it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. That's in 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Flee, run away. Scripture also teaches that there are two kinds of people, regenerate and unregenerate. The regenerate naturally produce love, joy, peace, etc., as the fruit of the Spirit. The unregenerate, in their turn, generate their own decayed fruit. They, uh, the unregenerate are also a tree. They are also a fruit tree, and they produce diseased fruit. The works of the flesh are manifest, Paul says, in Galatians 5, and idolatry is one of those fruits. Uh, in the middle, picking up in the middle of the, uh, one of those lists, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. That's Galatians 5.20. So you have the fruit of the Spirit on the one hand, that's the fruit that grows on one kind of plant, and then you have the works of the flesh are manifest, that's the diseased fruit that grows on another kind of plant. Now, this tells us that idolatry is a natural fruit of the natural man. Idolatry is something that the natural man naturally produces. Pagans naturally chase after a life of excess, and idolatry is right in the middle of that kind of lifestyle. Uh, this is from 1 Peter 4, verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. There's our word. In one other place, Paul uses the word to talk about something that is tantamount to this kind of gross idolatry, this external idolatry. Uh, and this is where he identifies covetousness as a form of idolatry. I cite the Colossians passage here, but he does something very similar in Ephesians as well. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. fornication uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So greed, wanting your neighbor's car or bank book or wife or you know, whatever it is you want, that is idolatry. He says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is anything mentioned or implied by the Tenth Commandment, which is anything that is your neighbor's. And so, when, when you're envious or covetous, you are an idolater. And this helps, to give, us a, uh, this helps give us a wor working definition of idolatry. Idolatry happens when any created thing comes to occupy the place in our hearts that only the living God should occupy. When you're trying to squeeze out of a finite thing what only the infinite can provide, you are an idolater. If you want your nation or your family or your bank account or your insurance policy or your political party or whatever it is to provide you with meaning and purpose, then you are an idolater. Of course, so that's an internal idolatry. External idolatry is gross and, and really bad, so don't do that. But just because you cast down the physical idols of stone and wood, that doesn't mean you've cast down idolatry itself. Alright, continuing on with plod the podcast. This is episode 213, and 
This is our book review section. The book I'd like to review this time is another another Puritan work, uh, and this is this is a Puritan work with a Puritan title, long extended Puritan Puritan title, and the b- name of this book is "The Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth." The Heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth. Thomas Goodwin. Now, this book is devoted to showing believers that Christ is not an abstract, impersonal force for good in heaven. Christ is our high priest, Christ is our elder brother, and Christ has compassion on us. His heart goes out to us. And, and that didn't change. You, know, you can point to verses in the, uh, in the New Testament that show that, that Christ is as compassionate on the people when they were without sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd, and they were um, disoriented and didn't have any food. So Christ has compassion on them, or Christ has compassion on the people when they come to him for healing. And so he spends the day healing people because he has compassion on the crowd. Goodwin's point is to, sh- to demonstrate that Christ's demeanor of compassion that we see through the four Gospels does not evaporate when Christ returns to heaven. The demeanor of Christ shown to sinners on earth is the same as the compassion that he shows towards sinners on earth from his position in heaven. And for those, those Christians who like to kick themselves around or beat themselves up over things, you know, they, they think, well, yeah, God loves me, but that's sort of because he has to. Uh, he's God after all. And so there's this technical thing called love that he, he can say that he loves us. But I don't think God likes me. I don't think God likes me very much. That, it's that kind of thinking that uh, Goodwin is aiming at. So if you are the kind of Christian who needs to be encouraged, who needs to be encouraged about what God thinks of you, or if you're a Christian who knows Christians like that, this would be a good book to get. Uh, if you're a pastor and you find yourself counseling people who, are, who gravitate to morbid introspection very, very easily, this would be a very encouraging book to get. The Heart of, the heart of Christ in Heaven Towards Sinners on Earth. <laughs> This month, as a part of No Quarter November, we have a new audiobook dropping every Friday on the Canon app. You can keep up with all the new releases by downloading and subscribing today.